show our entry to the world of culture, gender, sexuality, tradition, business, and so much more. Hi, I'm Regina Gershman. And I'm Dr. Sam Dubé. Together, we're going to take you on an extraordinary journey with engaging people from around the world, starting from right here in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Hello, hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome to the Ticket Show. I'm Conchetta Rose. Jennifer H. Lundquist is Professor of Sociology and Senior Associate Dean of Research and Faculty Development with the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She received a joint PhD in Demography and Sociology from the University of Pennsylvania in 2004. Her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation Mellon and Humboldt and covered by outlets ranging from Time, Newsweek, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and National Public Radio. Her recent work includes her book with Celeste Carrington and Ken Hu Lin, The Dating Divide, Race and Desire in the Era of Online Romance. Today on The Etiquette Show, we have with us Jennifer Lundquist. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. All right. So let's just get right into it. So tell us a little bit about your backstory. Where did you start out? How did you get to be where you are today? Uh, with the book or just generally in my career? Generally in your career. Oh, okay. Um, well, I've always been very interested in why people do the things they do and how it is that society plays a role in uh, influencing the way people do things. And so social science has always been very interesting to me. I was a social science major in college. Um, and then, gosh, my first job, out of college was actually as an unpaid intern at the Smithsonian Institution, where it turned into a contract research position eventually, and it was on the history of exercise machines and how um, we were putting an exhibit together. But I got to do all the research in the patent office about the inventions of the exercise machines, and we were making a, an argument that the industrial revolution was also influencing people to think about their bodies as an extension of a machine and how could they improve their bodies with these exercise machines. And so that kind of lit me up to, wow, you can actually have a career asking interesting questions and writing interesting things about the data that you find. So that drew me into um, eventually graduate school and I uh, got a joint PhD in demography in sociology. I actually studied the military. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I was very interested in the social dynamics of the military. People don't often think of the military as um, one big socialist community, but in fact it is. And it's a really interesting way to look at some of the dynamics that we grapple with in civilian society in kind of this controlled environment. Uh, so I did a lot of research around that. That was my dissertation. Um, but I've always been very interested in uh, race and racial inequality. Um, and uh, so much of my work has been infused by thinking about race relations and uh, racial hierarchies in the United States. And of course, that's uh, a large part of what this book is about that um, I wrote with uh, Celeste and Ken, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but who have been um, really great co-authors and a lot of fun to do the research with. So when did you, when did you sort of know that this was gonna be your path? Was it in grad school or, or before grad school, I should say, when you decided to study this, or did you feel like in your heart, you know, I, I wanna study people, I wanna, I wanna know? Mm -hmm get inside and want to know why these things happen? I would say it was probably, um, you know, when you're in college, uh, it's not always clear how, say, my anthropology major or my sociology major is going to translate into a direct job. Um, and so having that first job at the Smithsonian Institute really helped me see the ways in which it could be applied to the real world. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I do as a professor is I'm very much make it clear to my students as we're learning maybe very theoretical things, the ways in which they can actually take that into critical thinking and apply it into a job um, or, you know, thinking from that very um, structural perspective rather than only an individual perspective about why things work the way they do. I try to make it very clear how they can translate that into many types of jobs that they can get out. So I would, as a result of my Smithsonian um, Institute experience. I think that's really where it gelled for me. Um, and then when I went to graduate school, um, 
I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into academia or if I wanted to uh, work in applied research. A lot of demographers work in think tanks um, or work for censuses and that sort of thing. Um, but I love teaching as well. So for me, being able to teach and be, being able to do research is really, it's the best, best of both worlds. That's awesome. So <laughs> our friends, and, and friends, don't worry, I had to look it up too. I didn't know what demography was. Can you better explain what that means? What is sociology? What is demography? Yeah, so I, it's funny that you say that because um, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time uh, when I went uh, to in my PhD, he always referred to it as demonology because he'd never heard of demography and he thought that sounded much more interesting. <laughs> uh, and perhaps it is. So uh, sociology uh, is the study of society. Um, and, you know, people study it. There's a quantitative component to it, a qualitative component to it, um, and many different ways of knowing. And uh, demography is really focused on three areas of society. Demography focuses on fertility, it focuses on migration, and it focuses on mortality. Basically, it's population studies. And most demographers tend to be very quantitative, you know, using uh, mathematical um, probabilistic forecasting to be able to predict what populations will look like based on fertility, mortality, migration patterns. Um, but there's also lots of really interesting theoretical insight within all of this, right? So you might be interested in a mathematical forecasting of fertility, but within that is, okay, why is it that fertility is declining? What is it about gender relations that may be influencing people one way or the other? What is it about the lack of supports, you know, say for childcare that may be influencing fertility? So demography is sort of the, the mathematical shell of, of population studies, but it's rich with all kinds of, uh, you know, social science insight. Mm. So you kind of need both, a hand in both to, to get the full uh, analysis, so to speak, right? Well, uh, a sociologist would not agree with that, and perhaps a demographer would not agree with that, but since I happen to have both degrees, I would say yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, so how, when did your focus shift to online dating? Was it when online dating sort of became popular, or was it a little bit later, you realized there was a connection, or how did that come about? Yeah, so um, actually, if I had to trace it back, I can remember exactly when it happened. Um, so one of the co-authors on the book, Ken, uh, was in a, one of the classes I was teaching. It was a class um, on race and immigration. And we were studying uh, racial segregation in the United States. And uh, the fact that racial segregation has moved hardly at all um, in 30, 40 years since the civil rights era, really. Um, we still have very high rates of uh, racial segregation throughout society, not just neighborhoods, but schools, workplace, et cetera. Um, and he... Uh, came into my office one day and said, it, wouldn't it be fascinating to, if we could get a perspective on how uh, this very desegregated space of online, especially online dating, how, how is it then that people interact? Because from a demographer's perspective, part of the reason that the quandary is uh, interracial marriage, interracial um, relationships are very uncommon. Given how, given if you were to like uh, randomly sort people together across the United States, interracial marriage rates should be much, much, much higher than what they actually are. So they're very low. Um, and so the question from for a social scientist is always: Is this because people have racial antipathy or preferences um, for only some of their same race, or don't want to be with others? You know, we have a long history of that um, in the United States in terms of you know our whole book is basically about the history of that. Um, or is it about exposure that we live in such a racially segregated society that people simply don't have the opportunity to form friendships that may blossom into um, relationships or, you know, they're not going to the same church. We, you know, we have all of these institutions that are very segregated in the United States. Um, and that's changing to a certain extent, but it's still incredibly resistant to change. Uh, so that was what we found really compelling. Okay, it would be great if we could actually get a hold of this data and be able to see not just what people say they, you know, how racially progressive they might be, but what do they actually do? When no one else is looking, what do they do in this online space? Um, and so that's really how the whole project started. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, a, a driving force is that. And then also just that from about 2010 forward, 
for the first time, and this a lot of this has to do with the advent of the smartphone um, and dating apps becoming so accepted um, um, as you know, a way to meet people. Uh, meeting someone online became the primary way that couples were forming. So prior to that, it was much more about one's peers, um, uh, meeting people in school, meeting out at bars, et cetera. And around, I think it was around 2013, actually, um, when it became the primary way, the, the most common way that couples would meet. And so from our perspective, this is a major new innovation in the evolution of courtship in late capitalism, right? So for, for centuries, the process of courtship, dating, marriage, has been overseen and regulated by the state and the family and the church, all of whom historically and sociologically have a vested interest you know, in the distribution of wealth and property, which is why they wanted to control uh, how this worked. Um, and so to us, you know, the, I, I can keep, do you want me to end there? Or do you want me to keep going? Cause I could go on and on. Please, <laughs> go ahead. So the concept of dating, the way we think of dating today, um, that really emerged in the early 20th century. And actually it was very controversial um, when it first started. Um, and what I mean by this is, you know, unchaperoned outings that often involve some degree of consumption. Mm -hmm. And this really began first among, among urban youth um, in the cities who were away from their families or had some, you know, had some degree of wages working in the factories um, and could take on more autonomy. And so, and part of the reason it was so controversial is because, you know, the family wasn't as involved in these outings, right? Um, and there was also this assumption uh, or suspicion that dating was very similar to prostitution and that there were, you know, gifts being exchanged and exchanged for, you know, dinner for sexual favors, that kind of thing. It wasn't really until the 50s that it became this kind of wholesome idea of dating the way we think of it. Um, so it's a really interesting history in itself. But yeah, dating was a result of industrialization and economic transformation um, and all the changes in the role of women's work and the family and the individual that came with it. And so young people for the first time had independence and who, who they wanted, who they could be with. Um, and so that is when the the shift in who influences who influences you in your sexual or, or partner choices shifted from um, more of previously the family, the church, the state, more to your school, your institutions like school, your peers, friends, et cetera. Um, and here's kind of where we get into the book. Um, so dating at the very beginning of the 20th century around, well, I would say 1910s, 1920s, um, this emerged during a social climate of post-slavery, where there is intense fear and anxiety on the part of white Americans who um, feared that racial mixing in a post-slavery United States threatened the social and economic status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and along with this, and uh, much of this is causally related to the end of slavery, eugenic science, that is the you know, scientific explanations of racial inferiority, superiority, that was becoming mainstream and very widely embraced by scientists and academics. So as a result of kind of dating uh, happening, becoming a thing, um, and uh, this fear around racial mixing, we had the proliferation of anti-miscegenation laws, um, which were intensively enforced from well, about the 1900s through the 1940s. And basically what the anti-miscegenation laws were legally regulating who could have sexual relations and who could marry whom, all related to race. It was a felony, essentially. And the primary focus in most states was keeping white Americans from black Americans. Um, but in many states, this also extended over time to police whites from mixing with Asians, Latinos, et cetera. And so it really varied state by state. Um, and, you know, anti-miscegenation law was really the core mantle of Jim Crow policy in the United States. I mean, there were lots of other ways in which racial hierarchy was enforced, but anti-miscegenation law was a primary one. And, you know, anti-miscegenation law wasn't only in the South, it was throughout the West and some parts of the Northeast, et cetera. Um, and in, in being able to legally enforce anti-miscegenation anti law, uh, this sort of ambiguous concept of race became much more quantified and science, you know, um, really socially constructed, but with the scientific um, 
venue. So we argue in the book that the invention of dating and the invention of race as we know it today happened together. Mm. Um, and so we argue that the modern notions of romance um, are you know, deeply imprinted with uh, this history in the United States, even if we are completely not aware of it. So even though anti-miscegenation law was struck down in the late 1960s, along with other Jim Crow era laws, although I will say some states didn't even remove their anti-miscegenation policy from their books until um, as late as 2000. And a significant um, minority, but close to 40% in some of these states voted against the removal. So, you know, there is residue, even though this seems so antiquated, right? right. And you know, as a result, this kind of, this lives on in the United States. So maybe not legally anymore, but structurally in terms of where we live, where we go to school, who, you know, what kinds of opportunity structures we have, who goes to prison, who doesn't, what our health comes up, health outcomes are even, and there's huge racial divisions, um, disparities in health outcomes, life expectancy. We've seen this with COVID as well. And of course that infuses our belief systems and, and social hierarchies. So, when the dating market then by the, you know, um, by the 21st century, about a decade into it, began to move online um, and became the primary place. And now after the COVID, COVID pandemic is probably more entrenched than ever as the primary way uh, to meet people. Um, here we see a very tantalizing from an academic perspective, step away from third party oversight um, with the internet now the primary way that couples meet and less influenced by third parties than ever before. And most of our third party, party influences, you know, were family, friends, schools, all of which tended to be racially segregated. So, you know, the interesting question is um, from an intellectual perspective, what are the implications of a desegregated sexual marketplace for the erotic life of race? So that's the backdrop of our, of our, um, of our, the question that we went into, you know, because online dating in theory has no segregation. So we were really curious, how do daters, them, how, how might daters perpetuate or reproduce it or resist it? Can it be a disruption of the racial order? Um, and uh, so here's what we did for the book. Um, but do you have any questions before I continue? Billy, yeah. <laughs> the first one that comes to mind is, you know, it seems to me in my very simple that every time something comes out in history, it's considered taboo. And it's mostly because it's new, right? Right, right. We're doing this for the first time. Ooh, that must be bad or it must be like dangerous in some way. Yeah. And yeah. you've just described is a history of that and a history of proving that theory very wrong, <laughs> you know? Right, exactly. I, it, it, and it blows my mind. Um, because because of our society today and we and we know the troubles that we have um, and I think of online dating and I go there's no trouble there that's fun stuff that's that's people <laughs> trying to network and meet each other and right and find friendship and find companionship right related to this but but you you know you're proving me very wrong in that theory and my goodness it's 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 really taken me aback a little bit to think of it yeah well sociologists have a way of taking all the fun out of things i will say that <laughs> well no, but we need you guys we need you to tell us hey we've done this before and we messed it up last time let's try it. <laughs> oh, let's not repeat history and i we we lose that somehow um in our society and i don't know if it's a, a new wave of thinking that tells us we don't need to know what happened before i'm just in the present moment but for right. this now but but there's so much to be gained from the mistakes that have already been made or or things sure. we don't agree with that we you know maybe don't even know we didn't agree with um yeah. No, so, okay, so let's focus on the book for a second. The Dating Divide, Race and Desire in the Era of Online Romance. The Dating Divide is the first comprehensive look at digital sexual racism, a distinct form of racism that is mediated and amplified through impersonal and anonymous context of online dating. So can you, I know you have begun already, but can you break that down a little bit for our viewers? Yes. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about how we came to know what we knew in the book. Um, so we were able to get a hold of um, millions and millions of online dating profiles and, and interactions from one mainstream U.S. dating uh, platform, 
Um, and we were able to see not only, you know, what all their profile information was and what their, if they had them, racial preferences were, but also who contacted whom, controlling for all of the other types of aspects on their profile that might also attract them besides race, um, and who responded to whom, right? So we have all of that data, which we analyzed for the book. Um, and most of it, we have an online tables because it's so quantitative and we, we really try to summarize it and make it much more digestible um, with just figures on the book. And then we also conducted in-depth interviews with 77 uh, Black, Latino, Asian, multiracial, white women and men, daters, straight, gay. Um, and this was really great to really put a face on um, all of the quantitative data and to be also be able to see variations from the norm. And I'll just, in a very uh, in a very brief generalization, there's a lot of detail in the book, but I'm gonna give you a quick summary of what those findings were of how people interacted with each other. So what we found is that race is the deal breaker of all characteristics. It operates more strongly than education, uh, physical characteristics. Uh, it is the deal breaker. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we often found, which I thought was interesting um, in interviewing, especially many of the white men, is this sort of this aggrieved feeling that they were disadvantaged in online dating um, and that they were being ignored. And yet in our quantitative analysis, we find that white men are the most desired of all men. And this has been shown in many other platforms, too. So this is not specific to the platform that we're looking at. Um, our quantitative analysis showed that almost all women and or all all women of all races and almost all gay men, actually black men um, did not show this, that their preference was strongest for white men. Um, now this, this preference for white men was statistically significant for other races, but especially strong for white women. But I found it really interesting um, that, um, you know, women and gay men of other races would respond first to white men and only secondly to men of their same race. So on the other hand, when it comes to preferences for women, so if we look at the ways in which straight men and lesbians, how they, who their preferences are, who they interact with, et cetera, we found that unlike for men, whiteness was not the defining characteristic per se, um, but the really the defining pattern was for same race preferences. So contacting others of the same race. Um, men of all race and lesbians of color do not seem to have a first preference for white women, but their same ethnic group. Um, and unlike straight women and gay men, they're also more open to people from all racial groups and except, and this is really important, except black daters. So we document a persistent and specific anti-blackness that operate, operates among the sexual preferences of white, Asian, Hispanic, multiracial, straight men and gay women. Um, you know, we have lots of theories based on our interviews for why this may be, but basically um, in terms of why is it that white masculinity is so highly valued um, more so than say white femininity, because we assumed that if given racial hierarchies and norms around hegemonic beauty, that white, white femininity would also be highly valued. Um, but what we find is that, um, you know, white femininity does not carry the same kind of appeal across all groups in large part due to patriarchy and, and gender norms, right? So the association with white masculinity is not just associated with sexual allure, but it also symbolizes economic and cultural power in a way that femininity generally does not, right? Um, and, you know, in, in our interviews, while there is plenty of resistance to this among individuals, we also see that this sort of valorization of white masculinity is really something that's uh, been internalized and, and reproduced by marginalized groups as well. Um, so, you know, that's a sobering finding. Right. So, as a, do you ever, I, I know you said um, you guys, you were speculating, but did you ever get to a founded why this is? Well, I mean, I don't think. People are not good at explaining themselves. They often don't know why they do what they do, right? Um, and even if they do, it's rare that they would admit that to someone who's interviewing them, right? So we have to get at, that's why the quantitative data was so interesting to look at because we could actually see behavioral data, but that doesn't necessarily explain the impetus, right, behind it or the, the what, why in there. Um, I mean, 
our argument, and we definitely see this indirectly from all of our interviews, particular, particularly um, with uh, white daters, but also daters of color. Um, it, it's hard not to, to live in a society where you have a racial hierarchy that's infused in the fabric of your society and not live and breathe it and enact it, right? And so mm-hmm. sociologically, people are, um, whether they're aware of it or not, have bought into racial hierarchies um, of preference and you know what is, what is desirable. Um, and one of the things that's really, I think, kind of sad be- about online dating is that there's so much hope for online dating because the, it could potentially be revolutionary because you are exposing people to others. And I will say that there is, for people who don't have these underlying preferences, I think it's rare, but for those who don't, they are, they, there is evidence for reaching out to people of other races. It's just not the norm, right? So we're documenting the norm because we're sociologists. We, we, we study patterns rather than the exception. Um, but what happens is, is you have this commodification of people and what many of the people that we interviewed describe as like this industrial assembly line of online dating it starts to feel very transactional and anonymous. And it's very easy to objectify and dehumanize others, right? And so you, it really normalizes this idea of racial preference. Um, most of the dating sites, the dating websites and the dating apps have racial filters, not all of them, but most of them do. And it really normalizes um, the idea that having a racial preference is natural, right? Um, So we would often ask people, you know, do you have uh, a racial preference and and why, what does that mean? Um, Because we find it fascinating that, you know, the dating market is one of the only venues left in modern day US society where it's like acceptable to articulate I like this race, I'm not attracted to, to, I'm going to filter this entire race out, right? I mean, in some ways, if you just take a step back and think about that, that's really, um, it really stands out as very different from the ways in which we think about, you know, racial preferences and other other dimensions of life, like, you know, home lending and um, college and mittens, et cetera. Um, so when we asked people about their racial preferences, people were pretty, mostly white daters, but also um, some daters of color were also, they were very um, matter of fact, but they did not see it as a problematic necessarily. They often described it in this language of it's um, idiosyncratic, it's natural, or it's almost biological, it's random, it's uncontrollable. And, you know, this is really the, the idea of it, it being idiosyncratic or random, that's completely contradicted by our findings, right? Because we find a systematic patterned uh, outcomes of racial preference that align with these historical and sociological racial hierarchies that we know historically, right? Right. Um, So one of the the terms that we um, coin in the book is we call it digital sexual racism. Um, And I'll just kind of, tell you what we mean by that. Um, So sexual racism is an old concept, right? It's as old as the fears that put those anti-miscegenation laws into place at the beginning of the the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But that degree of sexual racism, it really interacts with very fast moving digital technologies in new ways. So as I mentioned before, filters, right? That block out entire groups of people, you know, from the public public dating market space. I mean, just the existence alone of a standard drop-down box disciplines people into believing that racial preference is something that should be. And that is fascinating um, that that is so acceptable. Now, there have been um, in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing, there was uh, a lot of pressure put on Grindr and they took off their racial preferences. Um, But there's also the role of algorithms. And, you know, there's a lot of really interesting social science being done. And how is technology in some ways helping us get over our ails, but in other ways, how it are, is it also perpetuating uh, our problems? Um, and in this case, racism. And so algorithms, even if someone is not putting you know, their choice, or even if there's no filter option, uh, the way algorithms work, they need to be able to filter down, give people a choice of 
fewer daters. Otherwise, we suffer from what social scientists call the paradox of choice, which is you're overwhelmed, too much choice. It's, you know, it's worse than having fewer choices in some ways. Um, and so what they do is they base it on past preferences of the user or how that person, who, who they've interacted with before and who others have interacted with before. And so it builds in that racial preference and who they end up seeing, right? Don't choose it up front. It it does it for like automatically. It does it for you, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Yep. These dating apps are contributing to this perpetuation of this uh, the concept of of sexual racism, right? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um. You know, not necessarily on purpose, but you know, it's building in a habit, an old habit, um, a preference that we have come to believe or tell ourselves is. No problem, right? It puts it in there, even if it wasn't yep. that. Even if you if you are uh, one of the rarer kinds of people who really are open to love. So say I'm just finding love and I'm open to all races, I'm attracted to all races and maybe even all genders, you know, right. if someone tells me I should narrow it down, I will start to do that, right? Exactly, yeah. Then all of a sudden an idea is in there that was not necessarily there before. So how do we... I mean, I guess, what's the alternative? How do how do dating apps take that part out of it, or how do the algorithms take that part out of it? Is yeah, exactly. Well, um, I think that I think the most important thing. I mean, I, the instinct is to always to say, the dating platforms, you need to be better. You need to fix yourselves, and you know, we live in a capitalist society, and that probably is what needs to happen. But I. I do feel very uncomfortable with the idea of assuming that these corporations have our best interest at heart. I mean, at, at their, they want to make a profit and uh, people do have racial preferences. And if they don't give people what they want, um, that they're not going to make as much money. Right. And so, you know, there is that. So for what, what we really argue in the book is I, the first step is to, understand what's happening, right? To acknowledge that uh, these algorithms exist, that these filters might be problematic, at least to think about them, to think through them, to like think critically about why we make the decisions we do. Um, and to acknowledge that the personal is political, right? That there are political implications to racialized sexual desire. Um, now, I would never argue that the government should regulate people's sexual preferences, right? Um, that would be, you know, like going back to anti-miscegenation law, but in the opposite direction. Um, but I do think that it's really important for people just to be aware of this and to think about it. But I do think that dating platforms can also, um, despite the fact that, you know, they rely on profit and surveillance capitalism, et cetera, um, I do think that they can be much more transparent about educating consumers about what their algorithms are so algorithms are usually black boxes. We have no idea what's driving them. We don't know what variables go into them. So they can make them much more transparent. Um, and, you know, the, the algorithms, especially the ones that use race, are pretty unimaginative. Mm. There's this, you know, what, what dating companies are trying to sell is sort of this magic, we can set you up with your perfect significant other, you know, the, the magic match. The truth of the matter is, though, is that people don't actually know what they want, as I said earlier. And so this idea of assuming that um, my preferences for someone who's like me will result in um, uh, a perfect match, that is simply not true. And so we've done analyses of, you know, um, we have uh, a way of measuring uh, sort of attitudes and um, uh, belief systems. And when we look at the um, the role of race, we find that race has very little to do with how well people match in terms of their belief systems, right? Um, but people often think that you know, race is a huge part and cultural part of how people look at things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there have been some really interesting studies um, of looking at people's preferences and their romantic partner and then seeing if they actually if that's true, if that's who they actually do click with. Um, there was a study done, it was a big, uh, like a speed dating, face-to-face -face situation. Mm -hmm. um, and they had people list all their preferences before they started. 
And then they went around and met, you know, like a, almost a hundred people. And then at the very end, the people that people were most attracted to and had, you know, really clicked with had often had no bearing on what they wanted, what they wanted their preferences to be or what they thought they wanted. So I would argue that, yes, we have, it's important to give people less of a choice in who they see because otherwise dating apps are completely overwhelming, but it can be random or at least allow people to, um, you know, uh, check a box to reset the algorithm uh, to be able to, you know, have more control um, over that. So in any case, I, I think that there's a lot that can be done. And I also think that companies can do a lot more about just educating people. I mean, OkCupid okay actually did a great job with this where they would actually, um, they had a blog, they're now owned by Match, but back when they were their own entity, they had a blog where, you know, they were very upfront about, wow, this is messed up. This is what you all are doing, daters. This is what you're doing. You're uh, ignoring women who are, you know, overweight. You are, um, all you 40 year old men, you're only contacting women who are 30 and younger. You know, they would out people and they talked a lot about race too. Mm-hmm. Um, and consumers loved it. Actually, people loved reading that stuff. So it's not, I don't think it drove people away from the platform. Yeah. So yeah, I think that we can, um, if, if we're stuck with corporate entities in charge of def- allowing us to have a sexual marketplace rather than other options, then I think that those are some of the things that can be done. But I also think that we could think really creatively about what's a better online still, because I think that has a lot of potential for bringing people together. But how can it be not, how can it be like a nonprofit kind of dating marketplace, right? That's not going to be driven by the surveillance capitalism and profit, et cetera. So there's a lot of really interesting questions. I don't have the answers for them, um, but, you know, uh, lots of future research for lots of different people. Right. right. And, and it just, I, I, I do feel a sense of that it kind of comes back to making a dollar, you know, um, which is unfortunate because someone like myself, like you're enlightening me to a whole bunch of things that I didn't know. And, you know, someone like myself would be taken by that, that situation and not really think twice about it because I don't know to think twice about it, you know, and right. it's my fault. I should do my own kind of research and, and think more, Um, creatively or think more about what I'm doing. But more often than not, I do feel that people as as a general, just they have the idea and pursue the idea. So if I want to meet someone, I'm going online. You know, I'm thinking about what's controlling my choices or what choices I'm actually in control of myself, you know? And so I I don't know, I, I agree with you. I think there's transparency is, is, is the word, you know, um, to tell people, hey, just so you know, you're going into this, thinking this thing, but a whole bunch of other things are going to happen to you along the way that might change that for you. And you don't even know it's changing for you. Mm-hmm. Right. There's some way to gain that information. If there's some way for these apps to uh, give us all the info, you know, um, that that would be something. And like you said, I do think it's, it's about making that dollar which is un- unfortunate for the people spending that dollar but not unfortunate for the companies making it because mm-hmm. that is such an easy thing to make money off of love yes exactly <laughs> you know that's I, I don't want to say it that way but it's it is it's alluring to people it's yeah. like, I want to say it's kind of like the cosmetic industry <laughs> <laughs> wear this shade of lipstick and you'll you know everything will be there, you know um yes. I fall into that all the time I'm like you're right I need that lipstick I need <laughs> <laughs> I need to feel better. So it's it's kind of that similar concept of, yeah. um, you know, something, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I'm losing my words, but imagination or, or dreamlike that we want to uh, aspire to, we want to attain that and right. just do it however we can do it. We don't, we don't actually necessarily think about what all these different steps. That no, are. right. We think of them as just our, you know, our individual, what consequences can there be, right? right. Um, so it's, a, it's putting a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the individual to think about. But I also think that society, you know, why we need to think about education. And, and to a certain extent, um, in the last, especially the Black Lives Movement, mm-hmm. um, I think that people are being re-educated in a way they haven't been since the civil rights era, at least white people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I think there's 
there's certainly hope. And I do think that um, online dating has so much potential, right? It's interesting, like outside of race, um, you know, just thinking generally about how people use the medium, it's just fascinating. Like you mentioned, um, you know, people think about like, how can I feel good about myself, et cetera. And there are so many people that we interviewed who often, you know, they'd be just going through a down period or they would have just broken up with someone and they might have no intention of actually meeting that person, but they'll go online for a while to get their self-esteem up, right? I mean, it, it plays so many different roles beyond just a sexual and dating marketplace that I find absolutely fascinating. And many people are researching this stuff. Yeah, for sure. So it makes me wonder, I'm sorry, get offline completely and go back to meet. I mean, right now it's a little, you know, where we are in the world, but go back to meeting people face to face and talking and engaging. Right. Yeah. What about you is interesting. Maybe I'll find something I didn't know I would like about you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, let's just scrap the whole idea, guys. <laughs> Fresh or something. Even though I know the world, you know, we're going to keep advancing, especially in technology. And there's going to be... Soon there's going to be holograms, you know, you're going to go on oh and date and the person's going to be there, but not really <laughs> <laughs> that much safer. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, I just I, I wonder what we can do as individuals or as a society, everyone together to kind of advance that, to change that. Um, yeah. And I, and I, I don't think it is only on the responsibility of the app makers or online dating specialists. It, it is on the individual. And I do think, I agree with you. I do think it comes down to education, but I find more often than not, I can't get the right info. I, some, mm, yeah. some company, something is preventing me from finding out what is it? Right. How can I change it? How can I reset it? As you said earlier. Right, right. Feel like yeah. There's a built-in system to just keep it going. And in addition, then we're perpetuating all this negative stuff as well mm -hmm. so i get yeah. to you but i'm not expecting you to have the one answer but what can we do what what can we actively do to sort of begin the change of this well you know like i think um i think there are there are comparisons that can be made to social media generally right so one of the issues with social media that we've seen especially over this past year is um it has become the public market, the public space, um, which is good. You have more people in some ways, very democratic, more people able to voice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, because they're on private platforms, the, the, what, what we've discovered and haven't expected is that um, the highest trafficked posts and those that go viral are the ones that are often the most ugly and or misinformation. So misinformation actually spreads much faster than true information, in part because there's something so alluring to human beings about something controversial or anger, et cetera. Um, and so, and that wouldn't happen necessarily if there wasn't profit that was generating those patterns, right? And so to me, and, you know, there are many computational social scientists and others who are looking at this and trying to figure out, is there a way that we can, A, regulate social media and the Internet so that there's at least some control over this? Or better yet, is there a way that we can create these spaces that are similar for social media, for dating, for all of the things we want to do in the public square that we once did face to face? And we still want to do the face to face stuff, too. Um, is there a way that we can design that as people, right? As you know, it doesn't have to be a company that uh, owns it, that is proprietary. It can be, um, you know, a nonprofit organization or a neighborhood organization or et cetera. Like, I think that there are ways that we will figure out in the future to make this much more grassroots. Uh, but it's, you know, the internet is the wild west. And it's just like companies have that have a lot of money and power are able to figure out how to make it work best for them. And we're just sort of, there's so much about it that is beguiling that it's difficult to question all the negative, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, some really, really interesting questions in there. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> viewers, you know, take part, take part, take a stand, change it up. I don't know. There are many creators and inventors out there. Invent something new, invent a way. Yes. 
to stop, invent a way for a, a, a new train of thought to, to, you know, take flight, so to speak. Right. Please, yeah. for all of us, you know, for yourself too. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you know, take the good from this online dating platform. And there's a lot of good there too. There is. There so is. take the good, leave the bad, keep innovating, you know, to, to make it a healthier space. Right. And that goes, I mean, that's a very general statement for society as it is, it is. <laughs> especially, you know, especially uh, considering, you know, we're talking about dating, which, you know, as you said, became more um, friendly, so to speak, in the 50s, right? It became more courting and it was about finding love and marriage and having children and and kind of a, a an old antiquated version of the family unit. So mm -hmm. Nowadays, we don't. We don't abide by that anymore. So why would we abide by all these other antiquated rules? Right, right. So very, very interesting. Please, please tell our friends where they can get your book. Um, let's see. Well, they can go on Amazon mm -hmm. uh, and buy it from Amazon, uh, or they can buy it directly from the University of California Press webpage. Um, just type it in and look for Lundquist or Curington. Curington is the first author. Uh, and... I think that there's a discount on the UC Press website. So I recommend buying it from there um, if it is in fact cheaper than Amazon. That's amazing. So the dating divide, race and desire in the era of online romance. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us today. We so appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, this is Studio with the Etiquette Show. And I'm Sam. And I'm Sabrina. Oh. oh boy! Um, I feel like most of the relationships that I've had have like all been online, and it's no one that's like local. Yeah. Um, like I have this app, and it's kind of like Tinder for like teenagers, yeah. and um, I've met so many people on there. So I feel like it's kind of helped because like it's easier to connect with people and like have more time to talk. Yeah. But like seeing in people in person. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely like, difficult. It's. It's not ideal. <laughs> so how do you feel about like if a guy just comes in your inbox and slides through your DMs? Is that a yes or no? I mean, I think it kind of depends like on the guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. How he looks and like how he approaches. Yeah. And, like what he says. I'm very like, I'm like, I need to get to know. Like, yeah. I've had people be like, do you want a boyfriend? I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> what is your, what is your name? Your name is like Fitzgerald. Like, I don't know who you are. Yeah. And, uh, so if you were meeting people in real life, you're always over how would you go about meeting people? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to college in here, yeah. so I feel like that's going to be like a great way to meet people. Yeah. Um, and then otherwise, it's kind of just like, if I see someone cute in the mall, like I'll go up to them and ask for their Snapchat or their number or whatever. Like, I'm oh. super comfortable with that. Yeah, she's so super confident. I am yeah, not. I mean, wait, okay. how do you do that? Um, I don't know. I kind of you gotta just like make it to your mate until you make it. Like I don't really have a lot of self confidence, but like if you just act like you do, you just gotta go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you said you didn't have self confidence, but you have enough to believe in yourself to go yeah. for it. Yeah, girl. Oh my god. The worst they can say is no, and I'll never have to see them again. So <laughs> that, that is true. Right? Unless it's a coworker, but that's that's, that's very true. Right. Right. Gotta get fired. <laughs> 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 Find a <Finally>. way. <laughs> so. Uh,
Yes. A very like, simple woman. We <laughs> have to have good morals. Um, oh, definitely. Like you have to be able to care for other people. And then, uh, funny is also a big thing. And then I know it's gonna sound kind of shallow, but like you have to at least be somewhat attractive. Because like if you think about it, you're not gonna have like, a good, good connection with someone that you're like, really your close friend. Yeah. So what about when we're old and we're all in this? But then it'll be different because you already have built and, and you're already and you're, and you're already loving them. It's like you already have that connection, but like right now, like you're gonna, like if you think about it, like if you meet someone and they look kind of like grungy, you're not gonna want to talk to them. She said grungy. No, I think it's like if like, <laughs> you. Is that not me? Yes, grungy. <laughs> what, what's the right word for that? Like, I don't know, just like, like, like grimy, grimy, grimy. Musty, grimy. musty. No, I, <laughs> I think everyone's
everything together, go to our team, yeah. go to the city, to the, to the movies together. Yeah. I don't know, we have a pretty good relationship. I don't know, he used to be with me, so he used to hang out with me most of the time. My yeah. mother used to love him. He was really good actually. Yeah. yeah. And what did you learn from the relationship that you'll bring on to your next one? Uh, that you have to be confident about yourself. Yeah. That, I don't know, it's about trust and that you have to trust in your partner. Yeah. And that's exactly what I learned because, I don't know, it's just something and that you really have to communicate with your couple, you know? Yeah. Uh, because everything is about communication. So that's, really, that's how I learned about the relationship. yourself and to trust. So how do you love yourself? I love better myself now yeah. because I'm very confident now. How did you get that confidence and that self-love? It's just something that you learn eventually because yeah. you have to learn how to love yourself before you love someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, what does that look like? Is that like treating yourself a certain way? Do yeah, you, I'm treating yeah. myself better myself now yeah. I don't know I just feel that I, I like to go to the gym by myself yeah. some some activity by myself I don't know treat yourself you know what I mean you just need someone else to do something that you really like yeah yeah and what is the top three qualities that you want in your future um, to be someone that I can hang out with um, someone really down to earth yeah. and someone that wants to create or build a future eventually, you know? Someone that I can be with. Yeah. Basically, that's it. Someone down to earth, very yeah. humble, kind, and very easy going, I don't know. So what about red flags? Red. What, are, what are three red flags that people should always watch out for? Um, if your partner doesn't show, I mean, he doesn't pay attention to you, I mean, yeah. if you're with them, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're having like a dinner or something, they're always on their cell phone. Yeah. That's something that it, it, it is a red flag. Also, if you are a lot with you, if you, um, if you fight with your partner, that's something that you really need to think about because that's yeah. something that is going to uh, create the whole uh, environment for your relationship. Basically, that's it, I, I guess. No, that's good. Thank you so much. Oh.